So Carol, we were walking by the boar's floor and we saw an unusual item, but what else would you expect at the original Hobo Nickel Society booth? This was not a nickel though, it was a silver eagle and it has an unusual reverse. Can you tell us about it? Yes, it's on a silver eagle. It's dated 1995 and it's engraved by a modern artist who helped pioneer the modern movement and his name is Ron Landis. I actually like to refer to him fondly as the grandfather of the modern hobo nickel movement. So what is the modern hobo nickel movement? Well, we have classic hobo nickels and there's some varying discussion of when the dates of the classics end. If you ask the ANA, they put it about 1960. The original Hobo Nickel Society puts it at 1980, so there's some varying opinion. But you have a period of about 10 years where they used to refer to the modern carvers as neobos, and those were carvers that were doing fast carvings for profit, and they were not hobos, and they were considered as uh, poor counterfeits, so to speak, of, of the originals. They were hand engraved though, but uh, the classic carvers weren't taking to the modern artists making these coins. But Ron Landis, who had a background with uh, tool and die and engraving, he uh, started making some and he wasn't content to make quick carvings, five minute, 10 minute, 15 minute carvings and some for six dollars because he was an artist. So he took his time and he put in hours of labor and sometimes days and weeks of labor and more re in more recent years he can spend a couple months on one carving but he, he made a carving and it took him quite a while to do it to his artistic satis satisfaction and he said well, i'm not selling that for six dollars and i think he threw it off to the side in a bin well he used to do it as a hobby for himself and enjoyment and at one point he was talked into selling some or putting them in auction Prior to that, I think he did give some as gifts, but he was surprised with the auction results that some of the people bidding on it and buying were appreciating his work and, and paying him more fairly for his work than what was previously being made in the moderns. And so he kept working on these nickels because he enjoyed it and he kept making them better and better and more intricate. And uh, we have one coin here that's a silver eagle and uh, it has a uh, hobo with a dog and he has his bindle and there's a train in the background and you can see the train engine and the passenger, uh, the box cars and it says the original Hobo Nickel Society on it. So what's the estimated value of such an intricately designed piece on a large coin? Well, Ron Landis is one of the, the top names that you can get and he has probably gotten the highest prices for his coins from anyone and he's the one that pioneered the, the market. Uh, his coins can go up to $10,000 he's gotten for his coins. The owner of this coin estimates that this is maybe about a $6,000 coin. Wow, amazing. Yeah. Well, it certainly is a beautiful piece. So Greg, you, you've always been a market maker in uh, early American copper. I think you're one of the, probably the biggest market makers in the industry. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about uh, 1793 wreath cents. This is like an important issue, uh, important 18th century issue, early issue of the Met. But I wanted to talk about like on the upper end where that market is right now and what right. you have in stock. And then also for maybe a more mainstream collector, is there a 1793 wreath cent that they can afford? Sure. So what do sure. you got in stock today? Well, what we have in stock today, and thanks for coming up and talking to us, is we have a few different coins. We probably have eight 1793s available, various grades. We have a detailed one that somebody could afford for around $1,200. Uh, it's got a lot of definition. It's probably a good. And then we have some of the better known ones. One that came out of Tom Reynolds' sale just recently in February, and that would be a Sheldon 8 and that would be an AU58 PCGS grade that we have it offered for sale right now at $48,000. And we have some ones that are in between that. We, uh, we have a Sheldon 6 that I just recently got made and uh, it uh, came back tagged and, and that's an AU55 and a spectacular coin as well. And there's a couple people in this room that are looking at it and hopefully we'll sell it at the show. So what is it about the 1793 that makes it so exciting for early copper collectors? Well, you know what, the 1793 is so exciting because number one, that's really the first production year of the U.S. Mint. And uh, the pennies were the first thing that they struck. Obviously it was chain set, but after that it was the reef sets. And uh, it's just got a spectacular look to it. 
the way it, uh, it, the, the obverse of the design of Miss Liberty, uh, the way the hair comes. Uh, I also think one of the nice things about um, large cents in general is these were coins people spent. These were not coins like like a Morgan or something like that that they knew. They just put it away because it looked shiny. These were things that were circulating. Who knows who might have handled it or, or touched it. And it's one of these type of coins also that transcends the tight community. We're often, being a large cent dealer, there's a lot of stuff that only you know, large cent people will buy. But the 1793, uh, is collected and traded amongst all these dealers, uh, whether they deal in large sense or not. Well, n not to use a pun about strike quality, but a lot of people look at these early coins as being primitively made. But the, the two examples you have here in AU and these PCGS holders are anything but primitive looking. I mean, these have got razor sharp strikes, still have like lustrous it's surfaces, a nice color. They do. So they how, how often is that? case? Well, I have to tell you, we're going on our 11th year doing this full time and I will run into a coin like that. Sometimes it'll be two or three years before I'll see another one with choice surfaces. So I look at two different things when I go for a coin. I look at color and then I look at the strike and I want to make sure that there isn't a lot of uh, scratches or a uh, rub or something like that that's on the coin. Um, but to find one that's going to have choice and nice color that would be able to go into a nice holder and add to a really good collection is few and far in between. Another more reasonable one, but it's nice, is uh, 11A. I have an 11A that's in a fine 12 holder, and this coin is being offered here at the show for $9,200. Um, if you were to find a good, and we have a good that's available here, a good generally will run you somewhere right around $4,500 to about $5,500 if it's a true grade rather than uh, a genuine or a detail order, but a true grade whether it's NGC or PCGS. Still a little bit of money, but it's still within the reach of some mini collectors if they want to stretch for it and have a very important early U.S. copper. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, and a lot of things what I tell people is spend what you can afford, but keep in mind that you're better off to buy a better coin, even if it's going to cost you a thousand dollars more. Just go buy coins two times a year rather than six times a year. Get something that's really, really nice. However, we often get people that will start with a four and they'll end up with a 20 or even an AU 50, 58 at some particular time. Coin collecting is fun and large sets are just amazing. To me, they're amazing because they, you know, they were collected for hundreds of years and uh, a lot of them were also circulated. So for them to be still around and look almost brand new is amazing. Well, thanks a lot, Greg. It was a pleasure talking about these amazing coins. Well, I appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity with you guys. Thank you very much. Okay. So, Alan, I noticed at your booth you had these really thin coins called Bractates. What are these coins and why are they so thin? Well, today we're used to the idea of coins that are durable, coins that are going to last for generations. There was a point in time in the Middle Ages where the governments actually wanted the coins to break eventually because they were going to be recalled anyway. Uh, they would have what they would call it a renovatio. And at that point, they would call in all the old coins and you'd have them melted down and they'd issue you new coins. As a result, they didn't have to have coins that were durable. These coins are really about as thin as maybe three or four sheets of aluminum foil. Uh, they weren't invented for that reason. Uh, they were invented because of inflation. They wanted to maintain a certain amount of diameter and conserve silver, so they got progressively thinner to the point where they could not put a design on both sides because the design would echo through and the two designs would cancel each other out. So that is how you came up with bracteates. The word bracteate is a cognate for a word for leaf because they were so thin they could in fact float on water. And I don't know how easy it is to catch it on camera, but this coin 
easily flexes with just the pressure of my thumb behind it. So I guess at this period in time in Europe, uh, there was, uh, I guess they had depleted their silver stockpiles and mining. Well, they did still have some mining, but you had a lot of inflation going on as well. Uh, this period is mostly from the 11, uh, late 1100s to the 1400s that Bracteates were made. The very, um, the earlier Bracteates were larger. Um, this one is not as large as they can get. Some of them are bigger than silver dollars. Uh, this one here uh, de depicts a, a ruler seated, very, very linear. Uh, I don't know if you can get a close-up of it. And it is from Germany, from the 1200s. Uh, this one, much easier to see. You have a lion uh, on it. From It's from Brunswick. A, the lion is a symbol of, of Brunswick at the time. And it's very, very deep relief. Um, and now you said that there was infl uh, inflation at this period, but how, how would there be inflation in a time of hard money? Because the government keeps revaluing the money. The, you know, the, they might have ha had hard money, but many, many countries throughout history have had inflation with hard money if the government keeps saying, this is worth one monetary unit, be it a dollar or a peso, and they keep changing the amount of silver in that coin. Uh, in the 20th century, we're more used to them adding alloys to coins, uh, but in Germany and Switzerland in this era, you had the coins getting thinner. In the low countries, you had the coins staying uh, pure, just like the Bracteates, but getting smaller and smaller diameter. And when this was happening in France, they were, in fact, doing what modern coinage uh, issuers do. They were adding alloy. So they each had their own methods of dealing with the inflation. And this was a sign of economic weakness on the continent? Uh, yes. It's, you know, typically, the, the government wants to spend more money than it has, so they're trying to pull a fast one. Um, they're, now, that doesn't work for very long because the people find out fairly quickly the alloy has been changed or the size of the weight has been changed. Then they have to do it again to keep up with it because there's no longer an advantage. Um, this is a very cute one. The later ones got smaller and smaller as well. This one here, you can see a knight's helm with a crest on top. You know, very sharp there. And if you look here, you can see the same design in Cuse in the reverse. So how did these wafer thin coins survive all these years? Okay, how they survived? Most of them did not. Uh, the majority of them were recalled or broke. They were all remelted. The ones that survive are the exceptions. They are ones that were stored in uh, pottery containers, ceramic. Sometimes they were put in floorboards. Sometimes they were put in walls. Uh, in, in this part of the world, if you tear down a building that's old enough or you dig for a new foundation, you might very well find um, hundreds, if not thousands, of Bracteates. And do these survive commonly in what we would consider mint state? Mint state, no. High grade, almost always. By the time a, a Bracteate could wear down to what we might call fine, it had already broken into pieces. Right. So you're really not going to find Bracteates lower than very fine. And Bracteates and extremely fine are actually quite common. So how, how do people collect these coins? Like many collectors of other kinds of coins, people are either trying to collect one coin from every monarch, one coin from every location. Uh, also, in Germany, probably more than here, uh, people are collecting their local history. So they might want to have all the different kinds of, say, Brunswick uh, Bracteates crossing centuries. So there, you know, those are three basic types of collecting patterns, uh, which is not to say you cannot collect just purely on aesthetic values as well. So you know, every every collector makes up his own way of collecting. 
they're just some recurrent patterns. So what is the uh, entry price point for this area and what is what is sort of the range for the scarcer upper end pieces? Um, Bracteate Fenigs, the smaller Bracteate Fenigs of the 13, 1400s can be had for about 25 to $30 uh, in decent state of preservation. And you can certainly find the larger diameter ones uh, with intricate detail going for 500 to a couple thousand dollars. So Daniel, you always have amazing treasure finds, amazing treasure auctions. We walked by your booth and we saw this just spectacular piece of gold. You don't see gold like this very often. I'm sure it has a story. So, so what is this piece? Well, what we have here is a disc of gold, low carat gold. If you look, you can see it's marked XI, which is 11, only 11 carat. It's very low carat, uh, very low fineness, and it even looks rather pale. Uh, but that was actually fairly typical for the Spanish. They had a lot of different uh, admixtures. Um, but this comes from the Spanish 1715 fleet off the east coast of Florida. Uh, most likely it was found in an area um, which is called, they call it uh, Douglas Beach Wreck. It was one of the wrecks of the 1715 fleet. And um, we're excited this was just consigned to us for our um, upcoming auction in November. And um, as it is right now, we calculated the melt value is uh, about $38,000. So there's quite a lot of value just in this one piece here. Well, as you can see, it's very rough, and it's also uh, very natural in form. Most likely, they just scooped a depression into the sand or, or something like that and just poured the molten material into that. Uh, this is obviously very bubbly, but somewhat flat, so we figured that was the natural top surface. And then they stamped this in with some official stamps, and then there are also these three scratch marks, which we've seen on ingots like this before, but we don't know what they mean. So, so Dan, is there a known provenance to this piece, or do we know when it was discovered? That we don't know. Um, most of the 1715 fleet finds came from the 1960s to modern day. Uh, based on the circumstantial evidence from the consigner, I would say this is probably a piece that was found in the 1960s or 70s, uh, but we don't have the direct paperwork to, to show when it was found. Uh, I'm just going by the design of the piece and the, uh, the nature of it to uh, come up with a, a particular wreck and wreck site that it was from. But there's no question that it's Spanish and that it's from that era.